I'm not sure if you've ever heard of him, but E.V. Hill uh, was one of the, the, the great uh, African-American preachers of uh, the late 20th century. And uh, I want to pro play you a little bit uh, from one of his very famous sermons where he talks about his mama. Here we go. And I lived in segregated, discriminating South Texas. And I lived in a two-room log cabin, and I went to a four-teacher school where four teachers taught 12 grades. And I was the only 12th grade student when I graduated, and I graduated by myself, cum laude, president of my class, valedictorian. <laughs> and everybody laughed at him. He said, oh, no, 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 Ella, let the boy get to about eighth, ninth grade, and then take him out. He's big, and... Get him a job on Bob Stein's plantation and let him help you out. He said, no, he's going to finish high school. And they all laughed at Mama, but Mama was a praying woman. And she said, if I have to eat grass, he's going to finish high school. And so that evening when I walked home with my diploma in my hand, Mama was grateful, shouted all the way home. As we walked home, whole mile. And then Mama shocked the whole audience, and everybody was ready to lock up by saying, my boy's going to college. My boy's going to college. Well, ain't nobody in that community had gone to college, and I don't know when. And she said, but Ed's going to college. And Mama packed up my little suitcase and wrapped it in a rope and bought my ticket to go to school 200 miles away and gave me $5 all she had. And said, now get on this bus and go on down there to college and don't worry. And she said, and you know the reason why? I'm going to pray for you. And that's all I needed was mama praying. And I got on that bus and splurged on the way and arrived at Purview with a dollar and 90 cents in my pocket and walked into the bursar's office and a sign said, have $83 cash, cashier's check or money order. And I said, now, where do you get in line to pay? And they said, right here, right here. Here's the line right here. Just get in line. I said, all right. And I got in line. And the devil said, now, what are you doing? Can't you read? It says $83 cash. Do you have that much cash? No. Do you have a cashier's check? Never had one. Don't know what it is. Do you have a money order? No. Well, then get out of line. No, I'm not getting out of line. Why? Mama said <laughs> she was going to pray for me. And worked thus far. It, it brought us thus far. Papa died when I was 11. We had nobody to help us. We had no government to mail us a check. And I stayed in line. And then there was only three people between me and the clerk. And the devil came back and said, all right now, you're getting ready to be Face one of the greatest embarrassments. What are you going to tell that clerk when she says $83? You're going to say, Mama's home praying for you? Get on out of line now and you got a dollar ninety cents. Thumb your way on back home. Go on back to the cotton patch. Go on back to the peanut patch and shake a few more peanuts and maybe you can come next year. But do away with this business of faith and prayer. I said, I'm not going to do it. Mama told me to come to school. And Mama told me she was going to pray for me. And I'm going to stay in line. And then there was only one. And that's when my faith began to weaken. I said, Mama, Mama, there's only one left. But I stayed in line. And the girl who paid her money paid it. And then she began to wrap up her purse and took just the minute that was necessary. And at that very time, that she was backing away and I was walking up to say what I didn't know what I was to say. I didn't know what I was going to say. But at that very moment, Dr. Drew, the dean of the college, said, by touching me on the shoulder, are you E.V. Hill? I said, yes. And he said to the clerk, wait just a minute. Has he paid his money? She said, no. He said, you haven't paid? No, I haven't paid it yet. I'm, I'm, I'm here. But, but, but I haven't paid it. And, 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 and so he said, well, don't pay it. Because we've been looking for you all the morning. We thought you'd come straight to our office. And we don't want you to pay nothing. Because we have approved a four-year scholarship. 
that will pay all of your tuition, all of your room and board, will buy your books, and give you $30 a month to spend. So don't waste your money. Don't pay. And when I got out of line, I heard mama's voice saying, and I will pray for you. <laughs> don't you think it would be great to have someone like Evie Hill's mama praying for you? I, a real prayer warrior, a real intercessor. Well, if you've ever felt that that's what you'd like, someone like Evie Hill's mama behind you, on their knees, interceding for you, I've got really encouraging news for you. Because as great an intercessor as Evie Hill's mama was, I want to explain to you tonight that all of us have got a greater intercessor praying for us. Now, I want to read to you a passage of scripture and one commentator said about it that no passage of scripture provides greater encouragement for prayer. And I don't know about you, but I know that I always need encouragement when it comes to prayer. So this passage uh, really speaks to me. And if you need some encouragement in prayer as well, let's uh, get to grips with what God is saying here in his word. Here we are. It's Romans 8, I'm beginning to read at verse 26. In the same way, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for God's people in accordance with the will of God of God. Uh, I don't know if you caught it, but in those two relatively short verses, the Holy Spirit is mentioned four times. And so this passage, this famous passage, is about the ministry of the Holy Spirit. But perhaps one of the most neglected aspects of the ministry of the Holy Spirit, and that's the Holy Spirit and our prayer life. So let's look at what it says. It we're going to look in real detail here. And as we do that, what we'll notice is that we are told that the Spirit does three things in relation to our prayer life. So the Holy Spirit wants to do three things for you uh, connected to your prayer life. We're told the Spirit helps us in our weakness, that the Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. And the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for us with God's people, he intercedes with us in accordance with the will of God. So let's look at these truths. Let's look at these three things that the Holy Spirit wants to do uh, for us in our prayer life and see if we can get some encouragement uh, for our prayer life. We are told that the first thing that the Holy Spirit does is quite simply to help us. Uh, but to help us in a very specific situation, to help us in our weakness. And uh, I'm encouraged already, I, I don't know about you, uh, because I'm glad to hear that God wants to help me. That God himself, God the Holy Spirit, is interested in helping me in my life. Uh, because just like you, I suspect I often need help. And I often need help because of what Paul describes as our weakness. And I suppose the best way to explain what weakness means here is to say human frailty and human limitations. This side of heaven, we, we are going to experience tough times. We're going to experience suffering. We get ill. People we love get ill. We get stressed and anxious and depressed. We get confused. And sometimes uh, we, we reach almost despair over what's happening to us and the people we love. And Paul especially uses this word weakness to describe his own experiences of physical suffering. And so we could say that the, the word weakness uh, reminds us that as Christians, uh, we're going to experience tough times. They're inevitable. We're not exempted for them. Because of sin in this world, because of the limitations of being human this side of heaven, we're going to experience weakness, 
tough times. Now, I'm pretty sure that isn't news to us, is it? In fact, uh, there's a fairly good chance that some of us listening to this are right there at the moment. We're experiencing tough times. We are in our time of weakness. And when we go through these tough times, God has a promise for us. He's got a promise for you. And the promise here is that the Spirit is going to help us. He's going to intervene in our lives. Now, it's important that we get what the promise is here and what the promise isn't. Uh, We are not told that the Spirit is going to remove our weakness. Rather, we're told that the Spirit is going to help us in our weakness. This side of heaven, this side of Jesus' return and the new creation, our whole lives, we're going to be susceptible to weakness. So what's the Holy Spirit going to do? He's going to help us. And listen, the the word help here in English, boy, it it doesn't do justice uh, to the word that Paul wants to use for us to understand what the Holy Spirit wants to do in our lives. Uh, It's only used one place elsewhere in the New Testament. Uh, And to cut a a kind of long story short, uh, what it means is uh, someone who's going to help you by getting alongside you. Uh, someone coming beside you to help you. Uh, I saw a documentary once about the Sherpas in Nepal. And these Nepalese ma- men carry absolutely enormous loads up these sheer mountainsides. And it was explaining uh, how they managed to do that. There was a long line of Sherpas and, and they all had these huge loads in the back. But there was one Sherpa that had very little. He was carrying very little. Now, he wasn't uh, a bit work shy. What happened was that as they were making up the hill, uh, if someone was really kind of staggering and, and it felt like they were going to be crushed by the burden they were carrying, uh, this man would come up beside him and put his shoulder on and share the burden. And that's exactly what Paul is saying the Holy Spirit wants to do for you in your experience of weakness, of tough time. He wants to come alongside and share the burden. So just at that moment when you you think you can't take another step forward, when you can't go on, it's right at that moment God's word is saying here that the Holy Spirit wants to come alongside you and help you. And I suspect that that's a promise. Something that God wants somebody listening to this to know specifically. He's going to come alongside you and help you. And Paul goes on, there's lots of ways that the Holy Spirit comes alongside us to help us, but he wants to focus on one specific way. I can remember uh, sitting next to my dad's bed in Inverclyde Royal Hospital. It was a a terrible moment. Uh, Over the past 18 months, my my dad, we had lost him to dementia. Uh, Eventually, he had to go into a nursing home to be cared for. And and this just caused so much heartache to us all, especially my mum. And then he'd been taken into hospital and I, I was sitting by his bed. He was mostly unconscious, didn't know who he was, didn't know where he was. And uh, I couldn't pray. That, that I had no words. I just sighed and cried. Maybe you know what that kind of situation's like. When, and you can't put into words what you're feeling. and You don't know how to pray and, and, and you just end up sighing and crying. I was just heartbroken and confused. And there's a a further promise to us here. When we're like that, when we're beside the, the, the bed of someone we love who's ill, when we're in those situations that make us sigh and cry, when someone you love is, is suffering so intensely that you're too numb to articulate uh, your thoughts and prayers, when you're in a relationship and it breaks down and you're so wounded that, that you can't find words to say what you want to say to God, it's when we're in those kind of situations that this promise becomes real. It's right then 
that we need to hear about the ministry of the Holy Spirit, those times when we can only sigh and cry because of what's going on in our life or in the lives of the people we love. Paul says, we do not know what we ought to pray for. That's what we've been just talking about. And now for, here's what's so encouraging. Right at that moment when it's too painful and too confusing to pray, God doesn't abandon us or ignore us. Instead, we are told that the Holy Spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. Now, what on earth does that mean? The Holy Spirit, God himself, is going to intercede for you. Now, I know that interceding, intercession are kind of churchy words, but all that it means, quite simply, is that the Holy Spirit is going to pray for you. He's going to take your needs and he's going to bring them in prayer to God the Father. And so, in those occasions when you don't know how to pray or what to pray for or you just can't pray, it's in those situations that the Holy Spirit is going to intercede. He's going to pray for you and he's going to bring your needs and your desires uh, to God. Uh, when Anne uh, and I had uh, the children and they were young, uh, just when they were learning to talk, uh, they, they, they had a kind of very limited vocabulary, just a couple of words. And so often, uh, as, as young children do, they would just cry or coo or grunt. Uh, but Anne and I kind of learned what they meant. And so when they, they made these uh, noises, we would translate what they actually meant to the other one uh, so that they could go and get what Mary or Alan needed. And that's a great picture of what is being described here for what the Holy Spirit does. We are told, and it's a really odd phrase, that he intercedes with us, for us, through wordless groans. And so he's doing just what Anne and I did with our young children. He, he's taking these inarticulate feelings that, that we can't put into words. And he takes those, what we've just described as our sighs and our cries, and he brings them to God the Father in prayer. And so here's a truth that I want you to hold on for, on to. There are sometimes going to be things in our life that are going to devastate us and confuse us, and we'll find ourselves not even able to pray. But the truth is, at those very moments when our prayers are only sighed or cried rather than said, the Holy Spirit is going to come and he's going to take those sighs and those cries and those groans, those deepest longings and desires, and he's going to take all that confusion and he's going to shape it into prayer and bring it to God the Father. And something great happens when the Spirit intercedes for us. He takes all these longings and desires and our needs. And just look at what we're told in verse 27, that he who searches our hearts knows the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for us in accordance with the will of God. I was trying to think of how to explain that to you. And actually, uh, John Stott said something that explains it far better than I was able to. So I just want to read to you what that means. We do not need to be ashamed of these wordless prayers. God the Father understands prayers that are sighed rather than said because he searches our hearts. He can read our hearts and our thoughts and he knows what's on the mind of the Spirit because the Holy Spirit always prays in accordance with the will of God. And so the Father in heaven answers the prayers prompted by the Spirit in our hearts. Do you see what he's saying there? What happens is that the, the Holy Spirit takes these uh, desires and longings, sighs and cries, and he takes them to God and he aligns them with the will of God because he knows what's good for us. And God knows our hearts and so the will of God and uh, the knowledge of God and our needs and desires are all brought together in prayer that God himself can answer. And think about the implications of that. Sometimes at the very moment when we can't pray, actually, 
we're experiencing some of the most powerful experiences of prayer that we will ever know because at that very moment the Holy Spirit is taking those sighs and cries aligning them with the will of God and God is knowing our hearts what's best for us and it's all coming together in a way that God can answer our heart our prayers so what does all this mean maybe right now uh, you're experiencing weakness you don't know what to pray for or you can't even pray and i want to reassure you that right now this verse is happening in your life that god the holy spirit is interceding for you with the whole with the god the father who already searches your heart and knows what you're experiencing and knows what you need a football match, he's uh, Liverpool fans often saying you'll never walk alone. Well, the bottom line for tonight, that one thing that I want you to take away and always remember about this verse is that the Holy Spirit wants to say to you through these verses, you'll never pray alone. Even in the most confusing circumstances, even in the most devastating experiences, you will never pray alone for the Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses and intercedes for us with God the Father. Amen.